Hello, and welcome to my introduction to minerals, which you can think of as the building blocks of rocks. The reason I call them that is because rocks are basically aggregates of one or more minerals. For example, this common igneous rock, classified as a granite, is composed of multiple minerals such as quartz, hornblende, and potassium feldspar. So, what are minerals? Five conditions define minerals, the first being that they are naturally occurring. For example, naturally occurring minerals can be found throughout Amelia County, Virginia, where up until 2018 they were accessible to the public at the Moorfield Mine, which is located approximately 25 miles southwest of Richmond. Using Google Earth, let's zoom in on Amelia County. Geologically, the region is well known for its large and rare mineral deposits, which occur in a series of once molten igneous pods or veins that cooled off and crystallized into what are known as pegmatites. If we overlay a geologic map of the county, you'll see a variety of colors that represent the types of rocks that outcrop or are found beneath the surface. What I want to draw your attention to are all the pink and blue dots in the light orange and beige colored portions of the map. These are the locations of various pegmatites, which formed when igneous intrusions of magma cut through the surrounding rocks, cooled off and crystallized between 260 and 290 million years ago. At its peak during the early 20th century, the county had more than 70 active mineral mines in operation. The Moorfield mine was the last remaining holdout still operating in the county before closing in 2018. Now, the Moorfield mine began operations in 1929 following the discovery by Mr. Silas Moorfield, who, according to his account, stumbled across an outcrop of quartz that contained a large barrel crystal while he was out hunting on his property. Familiar with the minerals from other local pegmatite mines operating at that time, he suspected that the outcrop might also be a pegmatite. So, he drilled a hole in the outcrop and loaded it with dynamite. The detonation blew out and exposed large mineral chunks of mica and green amazonite. The Moorfield, like other area pegmatite mines, was mined primarily for strategic and industrial purposes, particularly during World War II before ceasing operations in 1949. It wasn't until 1985 that the mine was reopened as a recreational and commercial gem mine, primarily for amazonite and other rare mineral specimens. The Moorfield pegmatite has become world-renowned as one of the largest Amazonite deposits, not just in the U.S., but the entire world. Before it closed in 2018, the operation was still relatively low-tech, and access in and out of the mine required climbing down a series of ladders positioned within an entrance shaft, and then back out on ladders from a secondary exit shaft. Inside the mine, you could see the contact between the dark-colored host rock, seen on the left, and the pegmatite intrusion composed of light-colored minerals on the right. But it is the green amazonite, which is a type of potassium feldspar, that draws the most attention. It appears throughout the mine, but the best crystals are concentrated within certain portions or zones, which is informative of the chemistry and cooling history of the pegmatite. Of course, a variety of other minerals occur throughout the mine as well, such as massive amounts of white-colored Clevelandite, which is a type of plagioclase feldspar, large books of muscovite mica, massive blobs of smoky gray quartz, and red spessartine garnets. In the past, before the Moorfield mine closed, uh, specially arranged tours were occasionally given of the inside of the mine and to collect mineral samples. Hopefully they will reopen again someday and the public will once again have an opportunity to visit the site, tour the mine, and collect mineral specimens. However, since the mine is no longer open, you can still visit the next best thing, which is a full-size diorama of the Moorfield gem mine, constructed with actual minerals from the site in the Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. The second condition that defines a mineral is that it must be inorganic. This includes the crystallization of minerals from a molten state, such as those of the Moorfield mine, but also minerals such as this white calcite, which chemically precipitated and crystallized from groundwater that percolated through the fractures in this block of limestone, or this purple amethyst quartz that similarly precipitated and crystallized within a cavity to form this large geode. It should be noted that some organisms form mineralized hard parts in the form of shells, teeth, and bones. These hard parts, such as the shell of a clam or the ornate tests of microscopic organisms, may have the same chemical composition as the minerals calcite or quartz, but we don't refer to these organic, biologically formed hard parts as minerals. 
The third condition that defines a mineral is that it needs to be a solid, so no liquids or gases here. Many minerals form or break in ways that give them geometric shapes, such as these cubes of pyrite, otherwise known as fool's gold, or these octahedrons of fluorite hiding amongst a set of polyhedral dice. Halite forms cubic crystals, such as this large block, which is approximately 12 inches wide. Most of the time, minerals are found intergrown and interlocking with other minerals, such as this sample of plagioclase feldspar and smoky quartz. Either way, all minerals are solids. The fourth condition that defines a mineral is that it must have an ordered internal structure. The mineral halite, commonly known as table salt, forms when sodium and chloride ions bond together and assemble themselves in an orderly molecular structure that is cubic in shape. The weak ionic bonds between these ions allow the mineral to break or cleave easily along these planes of weakness, which is why if you've ever looked closely at some table salt under a magnifying glass or a microscope, you'll see that the crystals all have a cubic or rectangular shape. Minerals such as quartz have an ordered molecular structure with strong covalent bonds, so they do not break or cleave along any planes of weakness, but fracture, often producing something called conchoidal fracture. Compare that to obsidian, an igneous rock that forms when molten material cools so quickly that the atoms are unable to bond and arrange themselves into an orderly molecular structure. This amorphous structure results in a volcanic glass that fractures similarly to quartz and will produce conchoidal fractures as well. The fifth and final condition that defines a mineral is that it must have a definitive chemical composition. So minerals such as quartz, magnetite, and calcite all have their own unique chemical formula. However, you should be aware that there are some minerals that are polymorphs, which is to say there are some minerals with the same chemical composition that differ in their molecular arrangement and crystal structure. A classic example of this is the mineral diamond, which is one of the hardest minerals, and graphite, which is one of the softest. Both minerals are formed from differing arrangements of carbon atoms, which produces two minerals that are distinctly different from each other in terms of their appearance and physical properties. So now that we know what a mineral is, why do geologists care about minerals? Or more importantly, why would they be important to a historical geologist? Well, one of the reasons is that minerals can be used for radiometric age dating, a technique that allows geologists to determine not only an absolute age that the rocks were formed, but in metamorphic rocks, the age that rocks have been metamorphosed. Minerals that are found in igneous rocks, the ones that form from magma or lava, tell geologists about the Earth's internal temperatures, pressures, and chemistry, as well as the tectonic and volcanic environments where they formed. In metamorphic rocks, a characteristic suite of minerals will emerge, depending upon how much heat and pressure the rocks have been subjected to. Low-grade metamorphic rocks that have experienced relatively low temperatures and pressures will produce mica minerals, such as chlorite and muscovite, whereas medium to high-grade metamorphic rocks will produce minerals such as garnet and sillimanite. This information can be used to map out large-scale regional metamorphisms, such as that which occurred during the formation of the ancient Appalachian Mountains, as shown on this map of New England. In sedimentary rocks, the presence of evaporite minerals, such as calcite or dolomite, which have their origin in oceanic environments, suggests the existence of ancient seas in what are now continental locations, perhaps thousands of feet above sea level. The dolomites, a mountain range in northeast Italy, are composed of sedimentary rocks rich in the mineral dolomite, which supports the interpretation that these rocks were originally formed in a marine environment. Additional evidence is an abundance of well-preserved marine fossils within the rocks that are associated with warm, tropical seas. Other evaporites found in sedimentary rocks include mineral deposits of gypsum or halite. The presence of these minerals may inform geologists on past climate, geographic conditions, or, or both. Large salt deposits may be indicators of past climates that were dry and arid or closed depositional basins or shallow marine environments, such as a lagoon that became hypersaline and experienced a lot of evaporation. The mineral content of sedimentary rocks may provide information not only about the past environment where the sediment was deposited, but the types of rocks they were eroded from and the distance that they traveled from those rocks. Although there are over 4,000 officially recognized mineral specimens, there is a much smaller subset of basic rock-forming minerals that you should be familiar with. Broadly speaking, we can divide minerals into two fundamental groups, 
the silicates and the non-silicates. The silicates are defined by the presence of the silicon oxygen tetrahedron. This negatively charged ion bonds with other elements and serves as a molecular building block upon which a wide variety of silicate minerals are built. They can be further divided into two broad categories based on their chemical composition. Silicates that are rich in iron and magnesium are considered mafic minerals and are typically dark in color. Silicates that are silica rich and have little to no iron and magnesium are considered felsic and are typically light in color. These minerals account for approximately 92% of the Earth's crust, so it should be no surprise that they can be found in lots of different rocks, be they metamorphic, such as this gneiss, igneous, such as this granite, or sedimentary, such as this sandstone. The remaining 8% of Earth's crust is composed of a variety of non-silicates, of which there are many that have chemical compositions which lack the silicon oxygen tetrahedron. The following chart shows the crust's most abundant elements. As you can see, there is a lot of oxygen and silicon. They form those silicon oxygen tetrahedrons which bond in various combinations with other elements, particularly the remaining six most abundant elements. These combinations produce a diverse suite of silicate minerals that, again, compose 92% of the Earth's crust. The feldspar group accounts for just over 50% of the crust's most abundant minerals, followed a distant second by quartz, the iron and magnesium-rich pyroxenes and amphiboles, various mica minerals and clay minerals, and other silicates accounting for the rest. The remaining 8% are the non-silicates. Starting with the silicates, let's run through some of the basic rock-forming minerals that you'll want to become familiar with. Plagioclase feldspars are part of a mineral series that include dark-colored mafic through light-colored felsic varieties. Potassium feldspars are also part of a series, but occur in light-colored felsic varieties only. Both types of feldspar come in a range of colors and share many similar mineral properties. However, there are a couple of distinguishing characteristics that you can look for in hand samples to distinguish between the two. Sometimes plagioclase feldspars will have closely spaced parallel striations along a cleavage surface where the mineral preferentially breaks or cleaves apart. Potassium feldspars lack striations but have an internal mineral feature known as exsolution lamellae, also known as perthitic wisps. Unlike the parallel groove striations which appear on cleavage surfaces of plagioclase feldspar, potassium feldspars contain internal intergrowths of thin, discontinuous, subparallel lamellae. As I mentioned previously, the feldspars occur in a variety of colors, such as the green potassium feldspar called amazonite from the Moorfield mine. However, green potassium feldspar is rather unique. Common colors for feldspar include whites, grays, and browns. Keep these colors in mind, but if there is any set of colors that you should associate with potassium feldspar, it would be a light to medium dark colored pinkish orange. The color of this common potassium feldspar mineral will be helpful when identifying and interpreting sedimentary rocks, in particular a variety of sandstone called Arcos sandstone. Quartz is a felsic mineral that all of you are probably familiar with to some degree. You may have seen quartz prisms for sale as decorative gems in rock and mineral stores or other retail establishments. Clusters of purple amethyst quartz, as well as numerous other color varieties, uh, such as those found inside geodes, are also popular. Of course, certain conditions need to occur to produce prismatic crystals of quartz such as these. Most of the time, it occurs as one of many mineral components in various rocks, such as granite, sandstone, or gneiss. An important property of quartz is that it is a hard and chemically stable mineral. The strong chemical bonds and orderly arrangement of silicon and oxygen in quartz mean that it lacks any preferential cleavage, such that if I smash those lovely quartz prisms with a hammer, they do not cleave apart to form more quartz prisms, uh, but they will randomly shatter and break apart, often producing a curved ribbed breakage pattern known as conchoidal fracture. Glass breaks in this fashion sometimes, so if you've ever seen a chipped piece of glass, such as from a broken bottle, you've probably seen conchoidal fracture. The size of these fractures occurs at various scales, such that they may be relatively large and easily visible in hand-sized samples of quartz, but may also be observed on individual quartz sand grains when viewed beneath the microscope. 
Because quartz is relatively hard and abundant, it tends to stick around longer than other minerals do. The Mohs scale of mineral hardness was created by German geologist and mineralogist Friedrich Mohs in the early 1800s. His scale ranks the hardness of minerals from 1 to 10, with 1 being the softest, represented by talc, and 10 being the hardest, represented by diamond. Quartz has been placed as a representative mineral with a hardness of 7, which is slightly harder than the orthoclase, a type of potassium feldspar, which has a hardness of 6. This is part of the story as to why many sand deposits, such as those found along the east coast of North America, are quartz rich, composed primarily of small grains of quartz. Considering that feldspars make up over 50% of the minerals in Earth's crust, and quartz only 12%, it may seem counterintuitive that we don't have an abundance of feldspar rich beaches or sand dunes. The other part of the feldspar story is not only that they are slightly softer than quartz and more susceptible to physical weathering and erosion, but they are not as chemically stable as quartz at surface conditions. Once feldspars become exposed to surface conditions, they not only weather and erode, but are also chemically altered, primarily through their interaction with water, into various clay minerals that are stable at the surface. The net result is that, despite their crustal abundance, feldspar minerals tend to weather and erode away much more quickly, essentially disappearing over time, leaving an abundance of harder and more chemically stable quartz behind in the form of those quartz-rich sands. Another pair of minerals that you should know are muscovite mica and biotite mica. These are not the only mica minerals that exist, but are two of the most common that appear primarily in igneous and metamorphic rocks. Muscovite is a light-colored felsic mineral, and biotite is a dark-colored mineral that has a more mafic composition. They are relatively soft minerals, ranging between 2 and 3 on the Mohs hardness scale, and split easily along a single plane of cleavage into thin, transparent sheets. These properties don't make for the sturdiest of minerals, so it physically erodes quite easily and essentially disintegrates over time. Two common mafic to intermediate mineral groups include the amphiboles and pyroxenes. Similar to plagioclase feldspar, these are also part of a mineral series, so there are several unique amphibole and pyroxene minerals within each series. Specific minerals that commonly appear within these groups include hornblende, which tends to be dark black in color, and augite, which tend to have a dark greenish black color. What's important for you to know and observe is that the amphiboles and pyroxenes are dense, dark-colored, opaque minerals that are rich in iron and magnesium. Their hardness ranges between 5.5 and 6 on the hardness scale, and like the feldspars, they are not chemically stable at surface conditions, so they do weather and erode much more quickly. The mineral olivine is a magnesium iron silicate that is defined as an ultramafic mineral and is often characterized by its olive green color. You may be familiar with gemstone quality olivine, which is called peridot. Olivine is a mineral that forms deep within the earth, within or near the mantle at extreme pressures and temperatures, typically reaching the surface via volcanic eruptions of lava, such as those that occur on the Hawaiian Islands or in Iceland. These eruptions produce dark, mafic igneous rocks composed of minerals of amphibole, pyroxene, and olivine, all of which are chemically unstable when exposed to conditions at the surface and weather more quickly. It is only going to be in locations close to these igneous source rocks that you might find beaches that are composed primarily of sand-sized grains of olivine or other mafic minerals rather than quartz. One final silicate mineral that you should be aware of is garnet. Although garnets do crystallize and appear in igneous rocks, they are best known for their formation within metamorphic rocks. Like many minerals, garnets come in a variety of colors, but the ones that usually come to mind are typical in metamorphic rocks and are the ones that have a transparent or translucent dark red to reddish black color. Gemstone quality garnets are used in jewelry, but their hardness of seven on the Mohs scale, same as quartz, means that they are also used as an abrasive. However, like other mafic silicates, they're not as chemically stable at surface conditions as quartz, so they do weather away more quickly. An abundance of sand-sized grains of garnet in a beach deposit would similarly suggest that they have not been transported far from the original source rocks they weathered from. 
During the early 1900s through the 1920s, a petrologist named Norman Bowen conducted a series of experiments that outlined the mineral crystallization sequence of silicate minerals that form in a cooling magma. What he found is that as a magma begins to cool from its molten state, the first minerals that begin to crystallize and grow are the ultramafic and mafic minerals. The temperature is still too hot for other minerals to crystallize, but those that are rich in iron and magnesium, such as olivine, pyroxene, uh, calcium-rich plagioclase, and amphibole are forming. In the process, the chemistry of the magma itself is becoming less mafic and more felsic, and as the magma cools further, other minerals begin to crystallize and grow that are more intermediate in their chemical composition, such as amphibole, biotite, and sodium-rich plagioclase feldspar. In the final stages of cooling, the chemistry of the remaining magma becomes felsic in composition, and the final minerals to crystallize include potassium feldspar, muscovite, and finally quartz. Alternately, you can run this sequence in reverse. As a rock is subjected to increasing heat and pressure, as tends to occur in metamorphic rocks, the felsic minerals in that rock are going to react and be more prone to melting first than are the more mafic minerals that have higher melting temperatures. Similarly, there are characteristic metamorphic minerals, such as garnets, that crystallize and form under intermediate temperature and pressure conditions. Of course, if we continue to increase the heat enough, the minerals that make up that rock will begin to melt entirely, starting with the most felsic minerals first, followed by the intermediates, and finally the mafic and ultramafics. So, when we're looking at some igneous or metamorphic rocks in the field, an identification of the mineral composition of those rocks, be they mafic, felsic, or somewhere in between, can quickly give geologists information about the temperatures, pressures, and chemical conditions under which that rock formed. Bring those rock samples back to the lab for some radiometric dating and additional analysis, we can get an age date for the formation or the metamorphism of the rock, and essentially further refine our initial field interpretations. As for the non-silicate minerals, of which there are many, let's take a look at some of those that are most common and that you should become familiar with. The first and perhaps most important non-silicate mineral for you to be familiar with is calcium carbonate mineral called calcite. It has a fun and distinctive property that helps with its identification, which is that it reacts in effervesces with just a few drops of some diluted hydrochloric acid. This property will be key to identifying a particular suite of sedimentary rocks rich in calcium carbonate called limestone that forms primarily in marine environments. The reason is because calcite is a mineral that primarily forms in seawater when ions of calcium and carbonate bond and precipitate out of solution. These chemical precipitates crystallize and settle to the seafloor where they accumulate to form an inorganic calcium rich or calcareous mud. You may also hear this referred to sometimes as a limey mud. Either way, in addition to these inorganic deposits of calcite, there is often a biological component to the formation of limestone, since there are a whole host of marine organisms that use those same ions of calcium and carbonate to form calcium carbonate shells or other hard parts. As these organisms die, their shell material also contributes to the accumulation of material on the seafloor, all of which may eventually become a limestone. So whether the limestone formed from inorganic mineral deposits, organically from living organisms, or as a combination of the two, limestones and their various forms will all react with acid because of their chemical composition, which is dominated by calcium carbonate. A non-silicate mineral that you're already familiar with, whether you realize it or not, is a halide mineral called halite, otherwise known as table salt. Like calcite, halite precipitates out of solution when ions of sodium and chloride bond together, usually occurring in highly evaporative environments. So a shallow hypersaline marine lagoon near the equator, or a temporal lake that periodically forms during seasonal rains in an otherwise hot and arid climate, may produce deposits of halite or rock salt, particularly over long periods of geologic time. Another mineral with a similar story is a sulfate mineral called gypsum. It too is an evaporative mineral that precipitates out of solution and under similar environmental conditions as halite. As you can see here, there are a few polymorphs of gypsum that include satin spar, which has a fibrous crystalline structure, selenite, which has a transparent to translucent tabular structure, and alabaster, which is uh, you 
opaque, fine-grained, crystalline structure. In the same way that silicate minerals in igneous or metamorphic rocks provide geologists information about past internal earth processes, the presence of mineral deposits of calcite, halite, and gypsum within sedimentary rocks provide important information about past surface processes and environments where they formed. A few more minerals worth knowing about include two iron oxides, magnetite and hematite. As the name implies, magnetite is a mineral that is magnetic and easily identified in hand sample with a magnet. It may also appear amongst other dark colored grains of sand found within loose sediment, such as in river or beach sands. You can test for the presence of magnetite in sediment samples by moving a magnet around within the sample to see if any sand or clay sized grains stick. Hematite has two polymorphs, one with a shiny metallic luster and another that has a rusty red earthy luster. In well oxygenated sedimentary environments where dissolved iron in groundwater percolates through the sediment, it will precipitate out of solution to form hematite, which acts as a kind of mineral cement that binds and lithifies the loose sediment together into a sedimentary rock. The red-colored quartz-rich sandstones of the American Southwest are good examples of sedimentary rocks that have been lithified and given their reddish color as a result of these hematite deposits. One quick fun fact of note is that water, in its frozen form, is an oxide mineral. It meets all the criteria to be defined as a mineral in that it is naturally occurring, inorganic, solid, has an orderly molecular structure, and has a definite com uh, chemical composition, H2O. Finally, three metallic sulfide minerals you should know about are galena, pyrite, and chalcopyrite. Galena is a lead sulfide that has been well known throughout the centuries as it is a widely distributed mineral appearing in igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks. It's easy to smelt and is probably the first metal to have been processed from an ore. The ancient Romans used the lead processed from galena-bearing rocks to make lead pipes for indoor plumbing, lead pots, cooking utensils, coins, and more. Uh, it's been argued, given the gluttonous habits of the emperors and aristocracy, that it would be no surprise if there actually had been a proliferation of lead poisoning amongst them, uh, the effects of which may have contributed to the fall of the Roman Empire. That, of course, is a debate for another class, but an interesting intersection of history and geology all the same. More recently, the mineral made its Hollywood debut in James Cameron's 2009 film Avatar, playing the role of a mineral called Unobtainium. I won't get into all the plot details, but it was an important part of the story, so if you've seen the movie, Unobtainium was just a chunk of Galena. The mineral itself is characterized by its shiny silver luster, although it will tarnish over time. It has a cubic form and cleavage that is fairly soft and brittle with a hardness of only 2.5 on the Mohs hardness scale. Um, it is a very dense mineral, so even a small sample will feel heavy in your hand. Pyrite is an iron sulfide mineral, which is the most common of the sulfides and like galena appears in igneous, sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. It is sometimes referred to as fool's gold because its metallic gold luster has fooled many inexperienced prospectors, past and present, who could not distinguish it from real gold. Pyrite lacks any cleavage, so it's a mineral that will fracture randomly like quartz, but under the right conditions may crystallize and grow into six-sided cubes, eight-sided octahedrons, or 12-sided pyritohedrons. Chalcopyrite is a close cousin of pyrite, the only real difference being it has some copper in its chemical composition, which gives it a brassier luster, helping visually distinguish it from uh, gold and pyrite. Although these minerals form in different rocks under various conditions too numerous to cover here, it is their formation in dark colored, organic rich sedimentary rocks and their role in fossil preservation that may be of most interest to a historical geologist or paleontologist. These minerals often appear in deposits of black shale or coal, which form under stagnant, oxygen-poor conditions, such as in a swamp or coastal wetland. The rapid accumulation and decay of plant and organic material in these environments consumes the available oxygen and releases sulfur, which becomes available to bond with dissolved iron, copper, and lead, precipitating out as deposits of pyrite, chalcopyrite, and even galena. Pyrite in particular often preserves organic materials such as plants or shells through a process called replacement in which original shell or plant material is dissolved 
and immediately replaced with a new mineral precipitate. And that covers the basic rock forming minerals that you should all be familiar with and are of particular importance to a geologist identifying and interpreting sedimentary rocks, sediment samples, and fossils. <laughs>